An explanation is probably long overdue. An explanation? Jesus Christ, Dad, an explanation? Look at me. Look at you. It's not as bad as it looked. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Dad. You mean you knew about this? You knew about this and you didn't tell me? I was hoping I wouldn't have to. Sometimes it skips a generation. I was hoping it would pass you by. Well, Dad, it didn't pass me by. It landed on my face. I'm Zach Bennett. I was born in 1981, but somehow I missed out on seeing the greatest movies of the 1980s. So I'm fixing that. I'm going to watch these great films and talk about them with my friends who have loved them for decades. This is Video Oblivious. Episode 6, 1985's Teen Wolf. It's the story of a, a teenager in 1985 in small town Nebraska who discovers there's a little something different about him. We're talking about Teen Wolf, 1985's Michael J. Fox hit. Of course, when people think of Michael J. Fox in 1985, the first thing they think of is always... Teen Wolf, right? There were no other big movies from Michael J. F no, I'm kidding. Hey, uh, welcome to the new episode of Video Oblivious. I'm Zach Bennett, of course, and my guest this week is Adam Stanko. Hi, Adam. How are you, Zach? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm great. So we'll get into how we know each other. You were actually my boss for about eight months. I'm, I'm proud to say that. Yes, uh, I was your boss, and uh, I'm excited to see what you're doing now. But uh, we had some great times together as we were we were building something new. You were a foundational piece to what we were building. Well, I appreciate that. It was a lot of fun working there. It was uh, for for the listeners. Uh, it was 24/7 uh, Sports, a division of CBS Sports that primarily covers college football, college basketball, recruiting, uh, and uh, coaching searches and transfer portal and all that. Basically, I think roster management is how you would refer to it these days used to be more about recruiting but college sports game has definitely changed but yeah we were uh we were launching something special that is still in the process of launching but uh i am i'm happy for what you guys got going on and we'll talk about more about that as we wrap things up let's talk about teen wolf mm -hmm. uh, this is a movie that i just saw for the first time this week and you have seen it for a long time. First off, tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, how old are you? Where did you grow up? Were you an only child? Did you have siblings? What influenced you to fall in love with Teen Wolf back in the day? Well, I'm 47 years old. I bounced around as a kid, was born in New York. We lived in Ohio. And then really my formative years were both in Massachusetts till I was about 11 years old. Uh, and then moved to Pennsylvania, where I always tell people I grew up in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Um, actually, town was Malvern, but went to high school in Westchester, and that's sort of where I de identify from. But um, I have two younger brothers. One's two and a half years younger than me, and then another one who's uh, 11 years younger. And and really, we're a huge basketball family. I, I was obsessed with basketball. Sort of got the rest of the family in. It wasn't something that was passed down. My dad went to high school with Pat Riley. In Schenectady, oh, really? New York. Yes, and uh, that's cool. That was uh, yeah. I, I heard a lot about that as as a kid. A lot of Pat Riley stories at both Kentucky and even just during his high school years. But um, basketball was just always in my blood. I, I was obsessed with it, and I think in a lot of ways, Teen Wolf hit for me at the perfect time. I mean, you mentioned 1985. I'm in Massachusetts. I'm I'm playing basketball. I'm, I have this love, this passion for it. And then the rest of the family sort of followed suit, including my dad. My parents were both at so many games for us as kids growing up. And then my brother, Randy, who's a couple years younger, ended up being a really good basketball player, played against Kobe Bryant. He was in our district in high school. So that was wild. And then, and then my youngest brother, uh, ended up actually becoming a college basketball coach. I tried to help him out. He was uh, he was a manager on the Arizona State staff with James Harden. Oh wow! And then he ended up becoming a grad assistant at Charlotte under Bobby Lutz and worked for a coach by the name of Glenn Robinson, uh, who was at uh, Franklin and Marshall in Pennsylvania, a Division three school. And then he decided, oh, I'm doing recruiting. I'm not making much money. I have no social life. I could do recruiting, make a lot of money, and have a social life if I do this on like the sales side and recruiting, you know, professionally, and not just not just for a, a small college, but it was a really good college program. So, it's sort of been a a huge part of my fam my whole life. So, Teen Wolf, I think, in a lot of ways, during the time period it came out, I think 
looking back on this question, once once you said, hey, do you want to hop on this uh, podcast? I think Teen Wolf sort of um, was almost an entryway or, or almost happened at the same time of trying to gather. But the reason I think why I love the movie so much is it was a huge part of my connection to the game of basketball. Cool. Yeah. You, so you were nine when it came out. Was it, did you see it when it was new, or was it more of a later on home video kind of thing? I saw it when it was I saw it when it was new, but I don't remember seeing it in the theater. I, it's weird because I think back to that time period, and I think I've seen it so many times, and I remember watching it on TV as a boy, and I cannot remember for the life of me. You know, it's it's one of those things where your memory at a certain point, yeah. you know, starts to fade on you. I don't think I actually saw it in the theaters. I distinctly remember seeing Michael J. Fox and. Back to the Future mm-hmm. in the theaters, but I cannot recall seeing Teen Wolf. But I saw it so many times over the course of my life, and it's funny how many little things you pick up on through the years um, as you as you watch it again and again and again. And I just think there's so many things about this film that you know you go back. It's e- it's an easy movie to look back on, and it's, it's it's a cult classic, obviously. But it's an easy movie to look back on, and people can say, well, it's not great. But for people who are my age, and I just was mentioning to someone today who's, who's also 47, lives in Tennessee, we've never talked about Teen Wolf, and I brought up today that I was going to do this, and he said, I think that's the best basketball movie ever made. But then you go and look at a Rotten Tomatoes score, I would never even go to a movie <laughs> in the theater in 2024 if it had that kind of Rotten Tomatoes score, but 42%. it was a different time. 42%. And I knew... Going in uh, from what little I had seen of it and pictures and things without having seen the full movie, that there was a basketball element to it. I didn't realize how much of a basketball element there was in this movie. A a ton. And it's not really great basketball either because apparently in this league, there's no such thing as a jump ball. (laughs) You'll do a jump ball after a free throw. I mean, the rules are just... And I don't know if it was just continuity because the film was rushed or if it was uh, deliberate script writing, but I'm just that frustrated me going, these are not the rules of basketball. There's a, there's a, a one that bothers me. There's a loose ball foul that then results in, in free throws, which wouldn't happen early yeah. on in a game until you've, you know, um, had enough fouls for that to be the case. The, the one thing about the basketball scenes, and, and for years this movie's been trashed because of how bad the players are and the actual basketball itself, mm-hmm. except for the, I guess you'd call him a stunt person, the but the double the who yeah. does the wolf stuff, obviously talented basketball player. But what's, what's interesting is, and especially when you rewatch it through this lens, I love how the basketball scenes themselves are shot. Now, I'm not talking about the players, and I'm not talking actually, again, about the rules and even how they're passing and their fundamentals. That part is terrible. I, I fully accept that. But there's something about what they've captured um, throughout, where they shot the angles they shot from. It's actually shot incredibly well. It's, yeah. That's the thing that, to me, stands out and doesn't have that cheesy feel that so many basketball movies try to capture and somehow miss because of the angles they shoot at and they just sort of miss what it in a weird way you get a feel for what it it's kind of like what it's like to play basketball because of where they're shooting from and how they shoot um and and the camera movements and stuff and that's the part when you go back in hindsight and watch it and say wow they they really captured that well and i think that to me at the time even though i didn't i wasn't able to verbalize it or i wasn't thinking consciously about this i think that's what stuck out to me most Hmm. Teen Wolf was released August 23rd, 1985, two days before my fourth birthday. So that's why I didn't latch on to this movie. I was born August 25th, 1981, so we were I was right at four years old when this came out. It was the Atlantic Releasing Corporation, which is long out of business. The, the rights to the movie now belong to MGM. Uh, it was shot on a $4 million budget. It, it opened, it was profitable right out of the gate. It opened at $6.1 million. It was the number two movie in the country for three uh, for four straight weeks, uh, and it was behind Back to the Future all of those four weeks. So it was it was a financially successfully or successful, profitable movie, uh, and Michael J. Fox was starring in both of the top two movies at the time. This movie can really, a lot of it, be attributed to Michael J. Fox's star power. I don't know if, if any other actor had been in that role if the movie would have been as successful out of the gate. Completely agree. Um, there's something about him, and and obviously 
I, I don't know. It's the phrase that that my my daughters would say now. Like Michael J. Fox was in his bag in the in the mid eighties, mm-hmm. as you will. I mean, there is this likable quality to him, and so throughout this film, and I, we'll get into some of the details and some of the scenes. But to me, throughout, what's so remarkable is scenes that would have been, to your point, so average, and even with great actors, it wasn't just the acting. There is something that he has a charisma that is just so likable, so relatable, someone that you want to be friends with. And obviously, he's carried that out throughout his life, and he's become sort of a, a hero now, I think I think we'd all agree. But during that time period, it was he could take these scenes, which would be sort of laughable or sometimes comedic, sometimes serious, and you just feel like you're always rooting for Michael J. Fox. And that same thing that works so well in Back to the Future, which is obviously outstanding. And then, you know, all the other films he's done. And I think about things like, you know, Doc Hollywood and stuff. But Secret of My Success. Secret of My Success, uh, another classic, obviously Family Ties. But but there's something about Teen Wolf where he's got this internal struggle throughout this this film, which could have completely gone off the rails. I mean, there's stuff in here that, again, almost laughable. He's not a good basketball player, so you, you already have that going against you. Mm-hmm. And yet, somehow, throughout, you are rooting for this guy. And even, even a theme, almost, throughout this is that he's smaller than everyone else, which you know is typically a detriment. You're trying to hide that when it's an actor, especially in an athletic role. Mm-hmm. And in this film, again, it works. It makes him the underdog, and it makes you root for him throughout. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's the star power of Michael J. Fox, and I will say, and I know we're going to get to it, to me, there are actually a handful of outstanding acting performances in this, and that's another reason why I'm in love with this, with this film. Uh, it, it, you, we mentioned the Rotten Tomato score, forty-two percent. IMDb's user rating, six point one out of ten, which is not great. Um, the director, and I didn't know this until I was looking it up. Rod Daniel is a Nashvilleian. Uh, he was born and raised here, graduated from Battleground Academy in Franklin uh, in 1960. He also directed the movie K-9 with John Belushi. He directed Like Father, Like Son that featured Kirk Cameron and Dudley Moore. Uh, and Beethoven's second, <laughs> the second uh, <laughs> Beethoven dog movie. But he was known primarily for his television directing. He di- he directed 30-plus episodes of one of my favorite shows of all time, WKRP in Cincinnati. Mm-hmm. He directed episodes of Magnum P.I., New Heart, Boy Meets World, even Everybody Loves Raymond. Uh, but his first professional job in the in the um, entertainment industry was he created a commercial for a department store here in Nashville uh, called Kane Sloan which is long gone uh, but back in the um, in the uh, the late 60s he did a commercial for a Nashville department store so interesting I, that one that one kind of uh, caught me off guard he passed away uh, about eight years ago he died in 2016 the writers of the movie Jeff Loeb and Matthew Weissman um, I think Jeff Loeb, they said, was a comic book writer at one point, and that the um, Howard line to Scott, where he says, with great power comes a greater responsibility, it, you kind of like, that's a Spider-Man thing. Well, that was done on purpose as kind of a nod to Spider-Man because of Jeff Loeb's comic book background. So, interesting thing. <laughs> Did you want to say something uh, well, about that? Well, what I was going to say is, it's interesting. So, I, I have a random Teen Wolf studio exec story um i went to ithaca college in new york and i spent a semester my senior year fall followed my senior year um we had a an la program in which you're studying not abroad but it's a satellite campus in la and that was part of the reason i went to ithaca and during our time there we were interning at you know different places in in hollywood and the film or tv industry and it was unbelievable experience but also, we took classes at this satellite campus, and we'd have guest speakers come in. I love Teen Wolf. We had an executive come in. I've since tried to think. I think it's Mark Levinson. Okay. He was one of the producers of the film. He came in, and the one thing that not only myself, but some of my friends remember is that being a smartass at the time, my line to him was, how upset are you that Teen Wolf wasn't nominated as one of the top 100 films of all time? Now, I was trying to get a laugh for the class, but I look back now because I loved the film, so part of me actually was serious about this. But I'm so upset because there's so much that I would have loved to have asked this guy, and then that's my one memory. And so to think that, you know, it's funny, all the what you're talking about, both in terms of the writing 
as well as with the director, again, th- this film wasn't thought of ever as this Academy Award nominated film or anything like that. And I'm curious as to obviously your overall thoughts now watching it. We'll get there. But but what's fascinating is that there you can definitely feel the the heartfelt moments you can feel these iconic scenes and and a lot of it still holds up in the way that i feel like just how it tugs at your heartstrings at times and there's something about the entire film not just michael j fox's performance no and and there's that relationship with his dad the scott and the howard character james hampton uh played howard probably the most likable character in the whole movie is his dad howard um he's uh, best known from uh, a variety of acting roles he was on f troop he was on the doris day show love american style i recognized him immediately from sling blade which is one of my favorite movies uh and i said oh that's the guy from sling blade uh he was also in the longest yard and he made an appearance in teen wolf 2 which we'll get to a little bit later on um so Susan Ursidi was the actress who played Boof. Mm-hmm. Um, that's pretty much all she did. She had some other minor roles. She was in the movie Zapped a couple of years prior, but nothing else notable. This was pretty much the only thing she did. And by the way, f- from my research, Boof, the reason they call her that, that was, I think, Matthew Weissman, one of the writers, had a friend uh, who was named Boof, a female friend, when that was her name. And so there's no explanation as to why this character is called this, because it's just a nickname. She has a, a, a I forget what the actual name is, uh, but they call her Boof. But that's why it was just kind of a, hey, I have a friend named that. So And everyone everyone remembers Boof. It's yeah. one of those things, it's funny, that that sometimes, and, and as you continue to do more and more of these podcasts, I'd be curious to find out, why some characters people remember their specific names they'll remember them like in a film yeah. and, I, and and when i'm talking about someone then it's not necessarily the star of the film it's always funny when you just remember and part of that was not just due to the actress or the performance but obviously just the name it was so unusual yeah that's to this day people remember you say teen wolf Boof will come out of their mouth in the next five minutes yeah. of conversation. Uh, it was kind of like uh, on the Dirty Dancing episode, we were talking about the character being named Baby and kind of how cringy that is these days that there's a female, <laughs> young female character named Baby. But it was the writer of the film that was her nickname when she was a teenager was Baby. So it was completely honest, but it was one of those that really sticks out, you know, and instead of just being called Jessica or whatever, random name. Um, Jerry Levine played Styles. He was also in Born on the Fourth of July. He was in K9. Uh, he was later an accomplished TV director as well. He did Monk, Boy Meets World, Chicago Hope, did a lot of stuff. Uh, still bouncing around working in the industry. Um, Styles, I hated that character so much. <laughs> I will get, let's just go ahead and go off on that. If I mention it, Please. I see the look on your face. I don't know if it was just he's he's just so douchey like and i'm i'm thinking is he supposed to be this cool 80s friend character or is he supposed to be an ass i can't really determine it and so i was my wife and i were watching the movie she had seen it before uh but she watched it again with me the other night when i watched it and we were talking about it and i said is he supposed to be cool or is he supposed to be just not and she she said she kind of interpreted that he's really a kiss ass. He wants to be cool. He wants to be thought of as the cool crowd because he go he volunteers to go get the keg right. And so he it's actually Scott who comes through to get the keg. But Styles presents it as, "Hey, I came through for you guys. I got you the keg." When they go to this party, but then in the next scene he's leading these party games like he is one of the cool guys so we we couldn't even figure it out what's your take on that is is he supposed to be cool or is he supposed to be an ass that is such a great question i think that at the time that it came out and this is one of those rewatchability characters moments whatever you want to call it but at the time that it came out I think it was somewhere in between that it's that it's a guy almost trying to find himself that's over the top character, over the top friend that's could be cool but almost like is a style all his own. But I think in a way why he now comes off as douchey, but I think at the time you wouldn't think that way is because I think what happened is his role has almost been parodied. 
I think it's been that we've seen so many characters through the years that are a similar knockoff of him that when you see him, you don't think of him. I saw him as the original version of this character who's now been portrayed different ways and people are trying to play it up and all this. His his sort of sense of style, everyone else is wearing throughout the film, like button-down shirts and jeans and all that, and he's got a graphic tee or, or he's got a comment on every T-shirt, a different scene that you see him. Everything's, oh, baby, come on, baby, like, um, you know, Vince Vaughn's character in... Um, Wedding Crashers? Uh, no, uh, the... The first one that swingers? he swingers in swingers, yeah. It's almost like a character like that is okay. almost who Styles was like the first one, and so it's almost like a comedian that when everyone else does a f- some you know form of Carlin or Pryor, and then you try to get someone now to watch Carlin or Pryor, and you go and they go, oh uh, yeah, it's not as funny as I thought it would be. It's like yeah, but at the time, I mean, here's this guy that's he's he's. I, Affable is probably not the right word, but he is he is outgoing. He's incredibly confident. And again, yes, comes off as douchey, but I think it's sort of because of how everything shaped through the years. So it's funny because I think it's sort of a combination of both. I also don't think that they looked at him as the cool guy. The other thing that's interesting, you mentioned the, the scene um, at the liquor store and first... You know, Styles is trying to get the keg and he mm-hmm. needs the keg to get in the party, as you mentioned. His pitch... To Scott, when he says, "Hey, now you go in," I wasn't able to get it because Styles thinks we. Uh, I had friends in high school that were like that. I had the one friend, Rob Lewis, that could go into the liquor store and he'd walk out with a keg because he could schmooze the guy. <laughs> Smiles thinks uh, Styles thinks he can do that. He knows Scott's not going to be able to do that. But what's interesting about it is his pitch to him is go in as if it's a robbery. That's the original pitch. He said, "Hey, you got a gun in your pocket. Tell him it's a holdup." Like. That idea in itself is insane to me. It almost doesn't even fit with anything else in the movie. No. And then and then the other part that's weird where Styles like it's trying kind of trying to figure out who is this guy? Like is he really sincere? Like he uses the wolf throughout. He exploits him, which I think is just kind of a phenomenal theme theme that speaks to sort of fame, which I think is a part of of this whole film. Yeah. And then when Scott's really trying to decide to do the right thing, Styles is like, "Wait a minute, no, you have to be the wolf in the championship game. You have to be the wolf for me. <laughs> like that's where he's ultimately like, this is all about me." And still, somehow through the years, and maybe it's because of how I looked up to him as a ten year old, eleven year old, whatever it was, I find him endearing. Okay. Okay, you and I disagree on that. <laughs> completely. Completely. But again, it's because I haven't seen it. I, that's what I love and about I think this podcast. We're in 2024, and I'm watching this 40 year old movie, and I understand that times have changed and cultures have changed, and what is considered cool among teenagers has definitely changed in those times. And as a kid who was a teen in the 90s, it was different even for me than the experience that I saw in this movie. And I understand it's a film, and and it's not entirely accurate as to what 80s life was actually like. That point, though, is so interesting to me because Teen Wolf, unlike a lot of films that came out, especially as you start to get a little bit later in the 80s, if you think about it, the style of clothing, for one... It, they don't look outrageous. It's kind of funny to think about a film that is almost 40 years old in which the characters' clothing, a lot of them, watch all the outfits that Scott has on. It's not like it's distracting when you watch it now because it doesn't have that stereotypical 80s clothing. Like I said, it's a lot of button-down shirts, jeans, that kind yeah. of thing. And then Styles is the one that sort of deviates from the rest of the characters. And he's got, again, the T-shirts with a saying on them. But that's not too different from what you'd see today and you don't see a lot of the big hair in this film it almost just like right they captured a time and i think it's sort of all understated too the style part of it which is you know style style mm-hmm. is because they tried to make it in being a small town in nebraska as you point out mm-hmm. i think in a way that understated nature is what keeps the style part the aesthetic keeps up with it and makes it relevant to this day and doesn't make the style side of it seem outdated 
small town in Nebraska where it takes place. Clearly shot in Southern California. <laughs> That's the best. <laughs> Palm trees everywhere. It's Jack in the Box restaurants. Um, matter of fact, the street. There's a the, the scene where Scott and Boofer walking down the street talking is the same street uh, that was used for Back to the Future, where George and Lorraine lived in the fifties. So, and when they were walking by one of the houses, I went. That's George McFly's house. He, <laughs> we might see Marty McFly walk around the corner here in a moment. Uh, very, it, it was. I think. Uh, you remember in? Um, I forget which Austin Powers movie. I think it was the second where he said, "It's incredible how England looks nothing at all like Southern <laughs> yes. California." That's what I said to my wife. I said, "Nebraska looks so much like L.A. It's just weird." Um, <laughs> in the winter time, by the way, because yeah, exactly. it's basketball oh, season. Oh yeah, I didn't even think about that. I didn't even think <laughs> it's about basketball that. season. Greenery everywhere. Uh, the movie was shot in 21 days. Um, six of those days were basketball scenes only. So the reason they had to rush it, that they had a lot. There, there were continuity errors. There were things like that that they just kind of waved off and went, "It's fine. We'll deal with it." Um, it's because. It was a very narrow window that Michael J. Fox had to film this movie because Meredith Baxter had gotten pregnant and they had to delay Family Ties production so that her pregnancy wouldn't show. So they took a a hiatus from Family Ties, which allowed him to come shoot Teen Wolf in a standard 21 day shoot. The story goes on Back Back to the Future is one of my favorite movies of all time. I know way too much about that movie. But part part of the reason Michael J. Fox didn't initially take the role of Marty McFly is because he couldn't get it to work with the Family Ties schedule because it was so grueling. They had originally cast Eric Stoltz to play Marty, and they came back after they realized Eric Stoltz was not going to work in this role, and they said, we really want Michael. How do we make it work? And he would shoot Family Ties during the day and go and shoot Back to the Future overnight, sleep for a couple of hours, and just do it every day for several weeks. They did that. That's why there's a lot of soundstage scenes in Back to the Future. There's a lot of night scenes because they, by necessity, to get Michael J. Fox, they had to shoot overnight. But with this movie, uh, it was a rush job. It was three weeks. We got to get this in, get this in while he's available. Uh, and his his time was so demanded, of course, with that sitcom. They were doing, what, 26 episodes a year back then? So that's half the year he's working on that. But he, he got it in. But the story goes uh, that Michael J. Fox did not sign up to do Teen Wolf 2, not because of scheduling conflicts, but because he wasn't the biggest fan of this movie. And there was... Uh, I don't know if it's true, but I read it online that he actually voiced some frustration during the filming of this and said, Steven Spielberg is making movies down the street and I'm here playing a werewolf. (laughs) So (laughs) I don't know that he was the biggest fan of it. But like you said, it's become a cult classic over the years. So many people just love this movie. And I joked at the beginning that, oh, Michael J. Fox, this is what he's known for from 1985. Clearly, Back to the Future, I was what I was referring to. But... This movie was the number two movie in the country behind Back to the Future for a solid month. It was a huge hit in that day. And it's, it wasn't just a huge hit in that day. It, 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 like I said, for those of us in our mid to late 40s at this time, like there, we look back with this film as something that was just so meaningful. There's something that keeps bringing us back to this movie. There's movies that you, you watch and you say, wow, they were great movies. And I don't know that I'd watch them again. Mm -hmm. And there's something about this film. And I think it's even, there's a couple things that I've thought about. And again, as, as the question was posed, like, why does this still matter to you? Why did you love it so much? There's a symmetry to it. First of all, the film starts out the exact same way that it ends. There's slow motion shots, him at the free throw line and all that. There are characters that you can remember throughout time. Like we talked about styles, Boof, in addition to the Michael J. Fox's character, Scott, his relationship with his dad is super meaningful. But then um, there's also Coach Finstock, mm-hmm. who is just incredible. And again, another character that I would make the argument that there have been a lot of copycats. And so while I don't think anyone would point and say there's a direct line from Coach Finstock to this character in this other movie, it's one of those things that I feel like has been, again, parodied. Uh, there's been caricatures of this character. And so I think it's like, but these were the originals. I mean, it's just insane. And there's also some stuff that in a weird way, again, that the scenes, there's moments in this film that so make it rewatchable where you know, okay, there's the basketball parts, but there's also the stuff 
the dance scene, the confrontations with the principal, the relationship with his dad when they're talking, Styles and him in the garage when he first reveals to him that he's he's the wolf, and then of course you know his his yearning for Pamela throughout, and then and then Boof being the the love interest really mm-hmm. that's always been there. But it almost just seems like so many of the scenes are memorable. So even though people can look back and say, well, it wasn't a great movie. There are still so many great memorable scenes where so many other great films I watch, I'm like, I can remember one or two scenes from there, but not 10 of them. Lori Griffin, we, we, you mentioned Pamela, mm-hmm. Pamela Wells. Uh, she also, this is kind of the peak of her acting career. She didn't do much else. Uh, then there was Mark Arnold who played Mick. Mm-hmm. He was on a soap opera called The Edge of Night before <laughs> he was on Teen Wolf. He was on 427 episodes of The Edge of Night. From 1980 to 1983, he did uh, the the soap opera Santa Barbara for 52 episodes. He was on One Life to Live, so he had the he had the soap opera career going in the early 80s. In two in 1994, he quit acting. He came back in 2009 and has had steady work ever since. So he's back in acting. He's not doing anything notable, probably nothing you've heard of, <laughs> but uh, he he's still out there. He's still working. And uh, we'll, we'll get to the, the Mick character in a minute. Jim McCrell is Mr. Thorne, the principal, mm-hmm. uh, or vice, vice principal. He was an accomplished radio broadcaster and a TV host. He hosted uh, game shows. He was on numerous ads. He was in Gremlins as well. Mm-hmm. So he, he might be recognizable from commercials back in the day. So we, we talked about the plot. Average teenager discovers he's a werewolf. He becomes the most popular kid in school, and he becomes the basketball star, but he, he struggles to balance that with being his true self. So there's a split identity thing. We find out that his father is also a werewolf and has somehow hidden this from him <laughs> for 17 years. One of, the, one of the plot holes that it's like, how did he not know, right? If, if this is something that... His is involuntary at times. How did he not know, right? <clears throat> um, we also find out that his mother is has been a werewolf of some sort. And did I hear right that Mick murdered Scott's mother? He, wh- he makes reference to because his... we we never hear we 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 hear reference of his mother. Yes, we don't know her name. We we know a little bit about her, but then there's this one offhanded comment in the bowling alley. Yes, where Mick says she was in the backyard and I shot her yes. or something like yes. that. Yes. Now the the weird part is it's funny that that you bring this up because again as you're watching and trying to figure out if that's the case and I've and I've thought about this quite a bit unfortunately. Uh, I'm almost ashamed to admit how much I've I've thought about this whole thing. No, it's the perfect place for it. Yeah, now. we can have the discussion about it. it's all it's all paid off. But I think the interesting part about this is he also makes a reference. Mick does at the dance to the fact that Pamela can't be with him because they'll end up having puppies. So I think I think it's just a theme that he's got throughout, referencing the idea that he's basically a dog, like that that. He's this wolf. He's nothing. He's a, he's an animal. He's not a real person, and so everyone should look down upon him. And obviously, he's he's the villain in this film, along with the vice vice principal. But I think it was almost a reference to. I didn't take it as he was the one who actually did this, but rather I took it as he's just constantly trying to put him down and say that essentially he's he's not a real human and not anyone who should certainly be respected. Um, and although the fact that his mother, they don't explain, they don't say at any point, they're, it's sort of vague in the background. I mean, it's obvious that, that it's the two of them. What I think is a, an unbelievable plot hole, and you sort of talked about it, is that not only... So his mother's a, a werewolf, and they don't reference what has, has happened to her. But here's the thing, is that I don't understand how, essentially... He, if it's Scott and his father as the only ones in mm-hmm. the relationship, like why would his father wait this long to tell him? Not just that he hasn't told him or that it hasn't popped up just in a fit of rage or something, but also what reason would there be to not say anything at all? Especially, I mean, he says it could sometimes skip a generation, but what? So then you're still not going to tell the, your I son? I think that's the explained away. Is yes. I was just hoping it wouldn't, so I wouldn't have to tell Yeah, him. so I wouldn't have to, but still, like, so you're going to, they have a close relationship, you still aren't going to say that. So I, I thought I mean, that, that was... that could be a correlation with, like, a parent afraid to talk to their kids about the birds and the bees. It's true. And 
and it could be something. It could be just Howard not wanting to have that conversation because it was going to make him uncomfortable and thinking, "I'll just avoid this as long as I can." Yes, and then it it it, it kind of rears its ugly head. But there was a scene just before the full transformation takes place in the bathroom, mm-hmm. where. Uh, Scott is saying, I'm, I'm thinking about quitting basketball. I'd rather be in the play. Some weird things are happening. And Howard almost says yes. something there. And then Styles walks in the room and the conversation changes. Um, also, Howard mentioned to Styles, nice shirt. And he wasn't looking at the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if. Howard maybe has eyes in the back of his head. I uh, see. And I, I take that line to I take that line to mean that. It's a throwaway. Styles is always showing up, interrupting, and all throughout the movie. Again, as we talked about earlier, he's wearing a different shirt that yeah, says yeah, yeah. something that may be offensive, may be ridiculous, whatever, may be funny, and so he just knows he's going to be in a ridiculous T-shirt. To me, it was almost like I. It's the moment you hear Styles. It's almost like you can say, "Nice shirt." It's 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 in a way an insult. Because you don't even have to turn around. You, so you just know. that's something that I, that's literally how, how I've taken that. I've got, you know, something that I've, I've thought about and um, what the wolf represents. And maybe you wanted to, to get to some of more of the plot in a little bit and we can get to it. But I've thought about this a bunch too. And I think that Scott's transformation into the wolf, I think the movie is ultimately at its core about like, obviously changes in his life and, and trying to stay true to himself and his relationship with his father and how he can help assist with this and making the right choices throughout, regardless of what's happening to you. And then in the end, if you stay true to yourself, that's what's going to be best and right. it'll all work out. I think the transformation to the wolf is about taking steroids. That is my conspiracy theory on this entire film. So at a point early in the film, Scott's father says to him, does that coach have you taking steroids? The team has the team taking steroids. So he actually references it. And Scott says, No, I wish. And it's kind of a throwaway line. I think it's at the hardware store. When, by the way, Scott's father didn't come to the first game of the season. So he comes to the championship game. That's convenient. But that was I always found that to be weird. <laughs> well, well the hardware the store? store is not gonna run yeah, itself. Exactly. Man. Exactly. Um, and I guess everyone has to shut down for the town when they're in the, the championship game. But if you start to think about that as a conspiracy theory, so if they know that steroids is enough of an issue, especially at that time, and it was really becoming something that was that was almost thought of as like a pandemic and and or an epidemic, epidemic I should say, yeah. excuse me. Uh, but as as the so during that time period, again living through it, it was thought of that steroids were you know this, this terrible thing that was now starting to invade. And if you think about what it does is it transforms who you are and the idea that it makes you appear to be someone, even if athletically, physically, in terms of attractiveness, all those things may seem larger than life and that you are this other person and you have this false bravado or confidence, which he certainly has. His character changes when he's the wolf that in the end, he has to now win this athletic competition without the aid of his performance enhancing other self, if you will. Mm-hmm. And so when you put it through that lens, that's what I believe. And I, I think someone, I don't know if it was the writers, director, whatever, I think it was a conscious choice to say this is essentially the theme that we're going for here is that steroids are what the wolf ultimately represents. Interesting. I hadn't hadn't considered that. And, I, and, one, and one more part about that, sorry, just because if we're going to get the full theory out go there. Go for it. Steroids also makes you violent at times makes mm-hmm. you act wild and erratic and that starts to become part where again and you think about all the you know made for tv movies that used it or you know any any of the shows during the 80s 90s where they touched on steroids it would also have that scene where it was like the person became too much and went in a fit of rage and he has that that's what he's ultimately afraid of when he has that moment at the at the dance or the moment with boof and you know in the in the um uh, at the party the when, they're, when they're in the closet, yeah. So Two minutes in heaven, <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, the some of the the themes, general themes of the movie that. Well, let me just let's just go ahead and say I didn't really enjoy this movie. Interesting. <laughs> I I I was I was a little bored by it. I think of all the movies I've covered on the podcast so far, this is the one I like the least, and I think because it it didn't seem to have any real 
plot. It, it felt like it was just kind of, it felt like it was a rush job. It felt like it was thrown together. Um, I thought Scott and his dad, I guess Boof, were the only real likable characters. There were a lot of unlikable characters in the movie. Um, and I was just thinking to myself, oh, thank God this is only an hour and a half. Because I just, I didn't, <laughs> I got 45 minutes into it and I paused it to go into the, into the kitchen and I was just like, Oh, there's still 45 minutes of this. I don't know. I just, I didn't, I didn't particularly care for it. I'm glad I saw it. I'm glad I saw it finally because it's one of those that, that I, again, this is why I put it on the list. I wanted to see it. Yes. I wanted to see it. And I thought I was going to like it more than I did. And I think it's because a lot of it to me has not aged well. One of the questions that I, I like to ask my guests on the podcast is if this film had been finished and was sitting in a can, for 40 years and we just found it what would we think of it today if nobody had ever seen it i think people would look on this movie horribly <laughs> it hasn't <laughs> particularly aged well uh in a lot of of its themes um mm-hmm. it is very time in the mid 80s you couldn't do a scene in in a movie today i don't even think they would allow it to happen where you have people standing on top of a truck surfing <laughs> uh, that, that's one of the ones that doesn't hold up the the yeah so a few things on so the the idea of of how it holds up i want to i want to get on i want to get to and in, in fact some of the scenes that i think are very clear and that being the case and what's interesting is though that's a tie-in to the first point that you made about you not liking it now i'm fascinated by this because yeah. i can completely understand because to me, and because I think it went to a lot of what I started thinking about when I said, why do I love this movie? And the time period that I was in and thinking about some of the things, because for me, it was, I I could sort of relate. It, it felt like a relatable film, not obviously being a werewolf or not obviously, like the theme of like Boof as this girl that was has been there all along is likable is and not just a caring character who cares about scott but also the fact that she has this relationship with his father which obviously is very important to him and in his life so there's that but the it's funny yearning after this the person that he should everything about pamela wells may be one of the worst characters ever there's no one she has allegiance to she's very clearly going after him when he's popular but even in the midst of that and at the height of his popularity he's like She's still telling him, "Oh no, he that other guy, that's still my boyfriend." Yeah. Like you're you're trying to figure out like who is she and and she all in in a way it's like she's just looking for toxic relationships it almost feels like <laughs> which if you're going to talk about modern day themes but I there was something about about this film and again like for me that felt um very personal again and also the probably the relationship I had as a kid growing up in the mid 80s with Michael J Fox where it's like yeah, there's the the parties and the, they're wild and fun and all this kind of stuff. But all he's doing is just trying to get through and live his life and do the right thing. And so it's fascinating to me because I can see where some of that didn't hold up. Where I think it holds up, like I mentioned, is actually, again, how it's actually shot. The angles that they shot, I thought the um, the photography in this film was was outstanding. What's incredible is like obviously there's like offensive language. There's the stuff where, mm-hmm. as you talked about, the surfing on the van, which is sort of like it talks about each of their characters. Styles is the guy that does it. Scott's the guy that drives, but no, it's the wolf. Scott's the one that's going to get up on the. Scott even the says, hood. "You'll never catch me on top of that." Yeah, on exactly, top of that truck. exactly, exactly. And then I mean the the scene that like the party scene itself, mm-hmm. which is about as iconic an 80s scene when you think about encapsulating the 80s. I wasn't partying during the 80s. I was born in 76, so 13, you know, when, right. when the 80s is coming to a close. But that's what all 80s movies were sort of striving to be, is like, how wild can the parties get? And Styles is like this MC of the party, which every single part of their... Um, names, you know, which by the way, like Boof lies and that's how she gets Scott in the closet. Every single part of that scene is like, you could never get away with any of this. It's like everything is sort of taking place and it's all happening at once. It's drugs, it's drinking, which that isn't taboo nowadays to put in party scenes, but it's like 
the the scene with him and her in the closet almost comes off as sexual assault. I mean, yeah. that's really what what we would think about it as today. There's especially with the claw marks oh, on, the, on her back. Got, she, that's that's unbelievable. When she starts walking away, everyone thinks about again another iconic m- moment. It's yeah. people recall that image. They think about it as her blouse being cut up, but really it's the red marks on her back, which are in, it, that part's incredible. And then you have, but then meanwhile the relationship just goes on as normal after (laughs) that point which is wild but you have but you also have with that um this idea that it's like the jello with the girl it's like not signing up for these things i mean it was just to an extreme with um you know all of this stuff and then it's everything people rolling around in the floor in their underwear and shaving cream for no discernible reason the girl that is helping styles by the way mc this is in lingerie and doesn't speak. She's just like handing him the names of people and helping him with this for no reason. She just happens to be in lingerie next to him. So everything about this, like as a 10, 11, 12 year old, mm-hmm. like that is the party I wanted to be at as a kid. <laughs> I have to fully admit at 47 years old and having four children of my own, I do not want any one of them near a party like that. So that is where when you start to get into some of the rewatchability, it's it's really uh, it's, it's remarkable. Point. But I will the other part to me again, which again, it's funny, the hold up, the rewatchability. The other thing I'll say is like the dance scene where everyone does this wolf dance in a way, again, was it's not that that was the first one, the first film that ever did a dance that all of a sudden everyone sort of does all at once. It was a very 80s type thing mm-hmm. and everything. Can't Buy Me Love, which came out a few years later, had an iconic dance scene that was very similar. I think it also was another trendsetter in that it did this this scene in the for a dance and then everyone sort of followed suit. So again, what's so interesting is when you watch it, at its infancy, and then everyone else copies. Those other films are copying the original. You watch it as someone that only watched the copies, and it looks like, oh, I've seen this stupid dance scene a million times, and this one is a worse version of the other. That is a theme that has come up several times on this podcast in various episodes, and people have brought that up to me. You're not the first one to say, no, you, you're so familiar with the copies. You've seen all these 90s movies and current movies that are done almost as, as homages to yes. the original yes. film, you know, uh, themes back in the '80s. That when you see the original, it's like, eh, it's not as good. Like you were saying with Carlin and Breyer yes. a few minutes ago. I have, I have one more thing for this. Yeah, go for it. And that is just about the plot, and that's really interesting when you watch. And it's kind of a throwaway line, but Boof is talking to Scott early in the film, and he said, "I had a dream last night, and you were you were in my dream. It was you and Pamela." and a bunch of chickens. And what's really interesting about this, it was total throwaway as one of their close encounters. And that was the other thing too, like being friends with a girl and you have feelings for each other. Like that was also something I always felt was was relatable. And it's it's this male-female dynamic that I always found was interesting, the relationship between Scott and Booth. And they're both very likable. So I think that that always appealed to me. But that line is interesting because it makes you almost think that later... It's throughout the film, obviously. The whole thing is his how he feels about Booth, but he's chasing after Pamela, and she doesn't want anything to do with him. And, I, and I've thought about, like, what is the chickens in reference to? And then I realize that I think it's all about his teammates at the end, and even himself, being scared to take on this competitor. Um, and what does a wolf probably eat goes after is chickens. the chickens. So, yeah. And by the way, Finstock, when he goes in and asks for his advice in one of the most incredible scenes of all time, the comedic value of this, I think, still holds up. He's got two great scenes, Finstock. Yep. The one when Scott goes in and basically makes the comment that he needs advice, and he's like, oh, sure, yeah, let's talk about it, Scott. And then Finstock, immediately when he realizes, oh, this guy seriously wants my advice, um, he tells Scott that Scott should be the one that's giving him money because he's in a bad financial <laughs> state and wants nothing to do with it. But he's eating fried chicken chicken and i think that and he offers him you know a leg or thigh or what have you so i thought there is something there in the theme of this thing of being chicken and overcoming it um which was interesting by the way the and the other outstanding scene with finstock is when he gives scott like his three rules in life which are just so off the wall that are just incredible amazing comedic character to me i don't recall that scene he says um i'm gonna give you advice there's 
uh, three things you should always know. I forget the first one. The second is never play poker with a guy who's got a name, uh, first name of a city. Oh, yes. I, and now the I remember. third yeah. is uh, never be with a woman who I think has an anchor tattoo is <laughs> is the other one uh, somewhere <laughs> on her body. But I uh, I cannot think of the first one, and it's killing me what, what that line well, was. Well, the coach, so. he's he's you're right. He is a good comedic character because he's just anti what you would expect a coach character to be, especially in an 80s teen movie where typically they're either just like a total hard driving, like hard ass, or they're someone who gives that that very mentor like advice not finstock he's just and maybe that's why the team is so bad he just doesn't i had i had teachers like that in high school who were also the coaches and the team was terrible and they were like eh whatever i'm just getting paid to be here the the Early in the film, when their very first game, which again, by the way, like I said, the whole thing comes full circle. They're playing the Dragons at the beginning of the movie. That's who they play at the end. And mm-hmm. all. It's their first game of the season. They establish they're getting crushed. The Finstock, when we first hear of him, he goes over to the coach of the opposing team and basically offers that he wants to forfeit the <laughs> yes. game. That's the best. Oh, I'll play if you want me to. By the way, just looked it up, and the first rule is never get less than 12 hours of sleep. Okay. So... Vince Stock is an all-time character. Yeah, that's great. Yes, he does. He wants to. He wants to forfeit because the team is just getting their ass kicked. And he's like, "I got players that are going for personal records here. I'm not going <laughs> to de- deprive them of that." I'm sure I may have had a coach or two in high school that wanted to do the same thing. <laughs> um, other themes in the movie. Uh, we we kind of noted that Pamela seems like kind of a furry. <laughs> she she's only interested in Scott when he is the wolf. When he's Michael J. Fox, she couldn't care less. But when he's the wolf, she's all about that. So one I, of those things. She's she, I'm I'm telling you, there's the the furry line's amazing. I never thought about it in in those terms. That's a uh, 2024 mentality. I think it, it absolutely yeah, yeah, absolutely yeah. is. I it's um and it's funny because again like his charisma but what's what's interesting again when you go back and rewatch his character which again and I, this is the part that i think really taps into scott's character and why it was so appealing to so many of us i think that grew up in this era because he's an underdog but just like in so many movies books a theme throughout history for male, male characters with with a woman it's do you have courage and he actually as himself before he becomes the wolf now that's when she starts to become interested and he has all this magnetism and and everything he's charming but when he is just himself early on he asks her out he's scared to do it but he does it he said hey are you gonna go to the dance you know i'd like to give you a ride to the dance so he's like hey pamela like he's trying to talk to her and she keeps blowing him off and that and and you know the line is that she wouldn't boop says she wouldn't say two words to you and then she does and it's You know, the two words are like get lost or something, Mm -hmm. and then Boof makes the comment. But that's the part that I think is is actually also really appealing and that makes him a hero. It's not just that he wins in the end, but like there's something about him throughout where it's like he still has the guts to ask this girl that he's interested in. And meanwhile, she is a terrible character, not just how she treats him, but how she's treating her whole her boyfriend, who's not a great guy himself, but throughout the movie. And Meanwhile, Scott has got this girl who's just crushing on him. Clearly, Boof is has she wants to be with Scott, and he's friend zoning her <laughs> to no end. I don't know if he do, do. You think he didn't realize it, or was he consciously kind of rejecting her? I I don't know. Did he want to keep it a friendly relationship? Because we see that Boof and the dad are actually very close. She's playing basketball with him and in the backyard at one point. So there's, so there's two parts to that. There's, I think he's oblivious, you know, no yeah. pun intended for, for podcast purposes. I think he's oblivious to it because there's their conversation early on. They're walking through the town, and, sh- and Booth says to him, you can do better than Pamela Wells. And he says, Who? And she kind of just, it becomes this awkward moment. She runs off, and it's its weird. It's weird, too, because the first half of the movie, when they're setting everything up, it's trying to be even more comedic than the second half when it tries to become more, a little more heartfelt and things mm-hmm. start to get wrapped up. But in that scene, leads you to believe that he just doesn't know. It's, she's making it obvious, and he goes, like, who? He literally asks her, and she sort of walks away. And then, to, to your point, when, when she comes over to play 
one-on-one with the dad, which I always thought was just such a great little scene there. And again, endearing to, to all the characters involved. The dad is like motioning, like, Scott, why don't you walk her home? Yeah. Come on, buddy. Like, from that point on, too, there is sort of this interest that he seems to show. In Bo- it's almost like even when they were in the closet, he's still not believing that she's into him. It was almost yeah. like she was forced to do it. But it's almost like he trusts his dad. And when he makes this comment, if you watch later on, hmm, maybe now he's he's interested in her. Now, oh, his eyes are open. Oh, Boof is interested in me. Oh, okay. I uh, Speaking of the dad, I did not see the dad's transformation coming at all. Oh. I, I, I was, I, I had no idea. And so when he's like, I know, I know what you're going through. I don't think you do. Yeah, I know you can show me anything. Not this time. And then he opens the door and the dad is werewolf mode. I was like, oh, cool. Like I, did, I didn't, I don't know. I was there any foreshadowing of it? I don't know that there was, but it totally caught me off guard. I did not know that about this movie. Other than the script being that language before where he's sort of saying it, but there's no foreshadowing in terms of, I mean, you're, you're the whole beginning of the, from the very start, here's Scott going through these changes and you're sort of, and you know, it's Teen Wolf. So, you know, those are the changes, right? They don't lead you to believe, but sort of when his dad is telling him it to, to the point that you're talking about where he sort of leads him to believe like, you know, Hey Scott, it's about time we had a talk or whatever. And then he's interrupted, but yeah, there's, there's no foreshadowing with that one. One thing that I'm curious about, it sort of lends itself to this, because I think with Scott and his dad, the other part is I think they're both good actors. So I think it's kind of cool that in this movie that again, not only you, but like has been panned by critics, like they think about this movie as just not being a great movie. You have these scenes where it's these two really good actors and, and acting well. And then, like I said, there's other characters that I think about as iconic. I think there's some really good acting in this film. Not that the film itself is well acted. I think the drama teacher is hysterical. Like, that. but <laughs> at, it, it was it was always a comedy. I, I was thinking. I know you were bored by it, and 45 minutes in, you were hoping to almost shut the thing off. <laughs> but but still, throughout, did you find yourself? Were there scenes that you found funny in the film, or were there moments that you found yourself laughing out loud, being that it was a comedy? Maybe no, actually no. I think I was laughing at how ridiculous mm-hmm. a lot of it is, mm-hmm. uh, and the comments I was making. It was like he they get in this dog pile on the floor, which yes. is not a jump ball. You've got the two entire basketball teams piled on top of each other, like they're going after a fumble in a football game, and then all of a sudden he comes out as the wolf, and everybody just stops. Nobody screams. Nobody has anything to say. It's total silence, and they're all just kind of looking. At each other, like, are you seeing what I'm seeing? And then they just go on with it, like, okay, well, this guy's a wolf now. <laughs> and <laughs> like, what? <laughs> that, that was that was the big question I asked myself: was how ridiculous is this? They don't like no character in this movie, with the exception of probably the vice principal and I guess Mick, mm-hmm. is in any way weirded out by this and and we later find out why the vice principal is weirded out yes because they have her he had a relationship with howard young, when he was younger and came in encounter with howard's version of his own werewolf but outside of them everybody else is just cool with it it's like okay well this guy's a werewolf now but is it, he's really good at basketball we're winning so it, it's cool it's 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 again i think goes back to the theory that if you think about it as the star player being on steroids Okay. Everyone else gets behind it. They're all proud of it. Like vice principal has some issues with the guy's dad, so thinks the guy's a fraud. What? It, so now you start to get in. Okay, that could be interesting. Why he feels that way? Obviously, Mick has a relationship with the, you know, the girlfriend. They're fighting over that where yeah. he's got an issue. But everyone else seems to be in favor of this. I, the, <laughs> I will say, two things that, one I like, and then one that bothers me about all this stuff though that you bring up. One is that. Where is like Mick is supposed to be the star player on the other championship team, the best team in the area, all this kind of stuff, has the girlfriend. Why is he always hanging out in Beacon Town? Like he spends all his time, he's always <laughs> at the same place as Scott is. It was kind of such a weird thing because you see characters like that all the time, but they're the bully in the school they go to. Yeah. This guy shows up at the party. 
He's everyone knows about who Mick is. Everyone at their high school. He's oh, at the you bowling know, alley. You know Pamela's boyfriend. He's at the bowling. So he's always doing things that they're a part of. He's at the dance now. Granted, again, part of that's the Pamela tie-in. He shows up to her, you know, practice when she's at doing the um, the play. So. Everything about this, I'm thinking too, when does this guy even practice for his high school team? And then the other one, I actually, again, something else that I liked that I just wanted to bring up that was an interesting, quirky note. I kind of always liked about this film, especially because of when I fell in love with basketball and when I started watching. Now, when I think about basketball and if there's a star high school player, everything becomes about the next thing. And especially being a part of 24-7, which we share in common. Mm Mm-hmm. It's always the next thing, recruiting. Where's this guy going to go? If they're a star player in college, everyone wants to know, all right, what's their NBA future look like? You type in any star player in college in Google, NBA and NBA draft will be the next thing that automatically populates. They never touch on what this means for his future in basketball. And I always appreciated that as like an in-the-moment thing. Not that at the time I again consciously thought of this but it like the only thing he kind of cares about or that the town cares about anyone even mentions no one ever says to him but scott you can't keep up as the wolf you're gonna this future in basketball style says you're gonna kill my business like people are talking about but it's all for him being the wolf in this moment in this and it's sort of like to me I, i this is speaking way big terms and themes and all that but almost speaks to the idea of enjoying life. Like, instead of constantly getting caught up in the next thing, enjoy what you've got. Be true to yourself. Like, those are wonderful themes, mm-hmm. even if the music, I mean, even if the movie itself doesn't hold up. No, you're right. And and it wasn't like a state championship. It was a regional championship. <laughs> Probably league championship. I mean, you, well, it's, there's a league. banner on the wall that says region championship okay. game. Okay, yeah. good, good. So, but it's, so it's not like... It's not like this high, really high stakes thing. In high school basketball, the regional championship is just one step on the way to yes. the state. And by the way, it's the championship, and it seems like in the championship game, how the Dragons have zero representation at this championship game is also something that bothers me. Why are all the fans just the fans of the Beavers? I don't, I don't get it. And there's one random guy wearing a Police Academy T-shirt yes. in the stands. And then, of course, there's the famous, the famous, the famous goof in the movie where an extra is seen in the very last frame of the film with the fly completely open. Yes. And there's been urban legend that someone was trying to show off his manhood in that scene. It turns out. That that was a, a female extra uh, that <laughs> said her pants were too tight, so she loosened the zippers so that she could sit on the bleachers so yes. that the pants wouldn't rip. So when she stood up in the cheering scene, the flies open. You can see the shirt poking out yes. through the fly. Yes, but it is one of the one of the more infamous movie goofs of all time. Absolutely, and what makes it. You can make the argument. I mean, the urban legend part is is amazing, and and what people will say, and still shows up on TikTok in in certain ways. But what makes it, I would argue, that it's the greatest goof, if you will, uh, of all time, is that it's literally in, as you mentioned, the final frame. But the final frame is of Scott hugging his dad. And so now you can't watch that. If you know anything about Teen Wolf, you probably know that, you know, mm-hmm. especially if you're you didn't grow up with it. That's probably the one thing you've heard about. Oh, Michael J. Fox and there's this scene where the guy does this at the end of the movie. But what's wild is it all builds up to like him being true to himself. Here's the climax. They win the game, but even bigger than winning the game, it's him and his dad share this moment. He even references throughout, I don't want to end up, you know, at the hardware store like my dad, what have you. You know, the mom's not in the picture, which was, you know, the dad raising his son as a single, like all this stuff is kind of fascinating. And there were new age themes almost for the time. And so for that to happen, when it's him and his dad embracing at the end also makes it like extra special in that so moment. It's and I, and I'll say go back. I just have to mention again. I talked about it multiple times how well it's shot. Even the celebration shots I thought are terrific in that. They would yeah. have been shot from a different angle. Watch it again, and it's like they are to me. Maybe the music at that time doesn't hold up for you, but the celebration montage and sort of when the audio comes in when it leaves. Yes, it may have been rushed, and that's how that goof ends up in the in the final frame. But again, how it was shot, I'm still impressed with. Uh, one of my biggest criticisms uh, when I did the Karate Kid episode was how it climaxes in the the tournament, and then he wins, and then the movie just ends. <laughs> 
And Teen Wolf does the same thing. Same it's thing. like he wins the championship with the team. By the way, with with no help from the wolf. And as my wife pointed out, this is the lesson we have to learn. It's all you have to do is really believe in yourself, and you'll be better than the other team. All of a sudden, <laughs> this team that couldn't play basketball were the damn. All of a sudden. They just believe in themselves, so now they've got what it takes to win the state championship. How about a character a named Chubb, by the way? <laughs> you talk about lack of rewatchability, and he's unbelievable, and he may be the MVP of the championship game, Yeah, um, especially that rebound. That, and the great that That's probably the most comedic scene in the whole film, where they're doing this montage of all these plays that they're having. The basketball's terrible. A shot goes up, it's missed. Chubb's sitting there and doesn't box out. It just goes to him, and the guy in the Dragons just flies by. It's just, it's amazing. I don't know if that was meant to be funny, but for some reason, it's it's maybe the funniest basketball scene. But unlike Karate Kid, in a weird way, though, you talk about how they squeezed it all in and shot the film in 21 days and what have you. Literally everything you needed to know about, like, wrapping up loose ends, yeah. we're all sort of wrapped up in those 30 seconds in the celebration scene. He walks by Pamela. He does, yep embraces with Booth and then embraces with his father. It's like the relationship with Booth, the relationship with his father. One more, actually, um, that <clears throat> I hadn't realized in all the times I'd watched and when I rewatched in order to do this podcast, Lewis, the character of Lewis, mm-hmm. is when you, when you watch it again, you realize he's his conscience. So again, that idea of playing the steroids role, the wolf is representative of what Scott is on steroids, Lewis throughout is his conscience because unlike because you mentioned the only characters that were offended, if you will, or had a problem with him being the wolf were the vice principal and uh, and Mick. But Lewis is actually the one upset throughout this other friend who he doesn't seem to have a great friendship with. They don't really have these deep scenes, which mm-hmm. if you if they spent a little more time doing it, I'm sure in the original script, I would guarantee that he plays a bigger role. You could tell they're friends, and all it is is they're friends, he's like a fringe friend, and then Lewis just is disappointed with him when he is the wolf. He's the only one, if you hmm. go back and watch watch that film. Uh, I, I do want to mention this just for the sake of mentioning it. I don't want to go too deep into it, because I don't feel like I have the... Um I don't feel like I have the credentials to talk about it, but I have seen some comparison to Scott, and especially with the with the uh, offensive language that is used in that one scene where Styles yes. says, "Are you when they're looking for the weed?" Yes. Yeah, when they're looking for the weed, and and he he comes out as a werewolf. And I have seen people in some of the things I read where it said in the LGBTQ community, it, this is actually seen as. Uh, an allegory to that because <clears throat> throw away the the offensive language that was used yes. when he was asking him I if he was gay but he had the courage to come out and say no this is who I really am and throughout the movie he's having to play between is this who I really am or is this who I really am and so I, I, I felt it was worth mentioning like I said I don't want to go too deep into it because I don't feel like I have the credentials to talk about it sure. but if you want to look into that and there are people online who have long dissertations about that that's very interesting to read I wonder if there I wonder if there's also the flip side of that which would be and tells you about the time period um, it's it's interesting to look at it from that perspective there's also the angle that you could look which is that Styles would have an issue with his friend being gay yeah. But being a werewolf, <laughs> yeah, like he's great with, which talks about. But but the other thing about that, well, he can make money off of him that way. There's that's that, why that it's is partly true. why the I exploit, don't like Styles. The exploitation, for sure. I will say too, at the party, and now this is part of actually sort of um, the 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 role gender sort of played in eighties mo- mo- party movies, mm-hmm. especially. We saw some of this uh, taking place, but there is. Um, a male character at the party dressed up as a woman. Now they don't reveal whether that's like part of being a gag. It was part of just his regular thing. So that's actually just a, they don't address it. It's not part of anything. Now, again, everything else that's taking place at this is sort of in a way at the party is almost like how offensive can we get? And let's go over the top. So at the time that could have felt like that was the case or like, Hey, let's humiliate this man by doing this to him. I don't know, just like you said, I, I, I probably can't speak to any of that. I don't have the credentials to. But at the same time, it's interesting because now that, that could add a little more credence to like, hey, there's another message that was being sent here in this movie. Uh, before we wrap up, the sequel, Teen Wolf 2, is it worth watching with Jason Bateman? 
No, but the trivia that's great. <laughs> no, it's 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 terrible. For some reason, it doesn't. There's something that doesn't resonate. What's so interesting also is that you you bring it up. Again, you take an outstanding actor. I, Jason Bateman's one of my favorites, who has a ton of likability. Yeah, and he's got this incredible tie-in because his sister Justine Bateman was on uh, Family Ties. She played Alex P. Keaton's sister. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And so it's it's kind of remarkable that that's who they chose uh, for that. But no, it's just uh, he's a boxer, and and like there's nothing. That's the thing. Anyone who no one will tell you they loved Teen Wolf too. I've never heard that in my life. And again, it's not like they got a lousy actor to play the main character. Yeah. And again, as you talked about, the dad is in is in the film as well. I think he's a cousin, right? Yeah, if I, I think were... it's a cousin. Yeah. yeah. So no, no, I love Bateman. I, I, his podcast every week I listen to. I, I have a huge. I, I'm a huge fan of Jason Bateman. I kind of want to watch it just to see Bateman in it. If you, I, I maybe this will show up on on yours, but uh, a few years after the fact, you had mentioned. Right when we started, um, Zapped was a role yes. that the I've seen had. Zapped. Yeah. Oh, you have. Yeah, you have. Yeah, that's I mean, why it's not on the list. I didn't care for it either. <laughs> it was. You want to talk about an exploitation film from from the time period? That's totally you could. And again, I I caught that maybe four years after it yeah. came out or something. But uh, but it's interesting that you bring it up. Yeah. No reason to watch Teen Wolf two. Yeah. Michael J. Fox, Small Town Nebraska. That was. Actually, small town in Southern California. Yeah. No, uh, Zapped was, was Scott Bayo, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah Scott Bayo was another in reason not to watch it. But. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, there was actually a third Teen Wolf in development. Did you know that they scrapped it? No idea. And it was a female pro- uh, protagonist that was to be played by Alyssa Milano. And she backed out, and then the movie fell apart. They took the script and reworked it, and it became the movie Teen Witch from 1989. Wow. So Teen Witch is somewhat a spinoff of, and maybe maybe not set in the same world as Teen Wolf, but it definitely was born out of a failure from the Teen Wolf franchise. Have you watched the MTV series or the movie that they made a couple of years ago about that? Once I heard that it didn't really have anything to do with the original, Yeah, that it was just sort of the name, like I almost found it offensive that how <laughs> dare you not play up and bring back this character this this world that they're in uh i would have been fascinated by but no i haven't how about yourself i haven't watched it either and when i heard about it i was like that seems like a very odd movie to turn into a dramatic series yes. in yes. in 2012 or whenever they started it uh yeah no i haven't seen anything of it I don't really have a desire to now either after seeing the movie. What uh, <laughs> question? I, and I know this is about my experience watching it. Yeah, and and what the movie has meant to me. It's about your experience rewatching it. But I am curious because your your wife got a chance to sort of experience both worlds. She had watched it originally, probably hadn't watched it in a long time. Yeah, didn't have the same feelings I did. Probably twenty. Was years. there anything that she said about the film that stood out, or that she happened to mention when you guys were watching together? Um. <clears throat> Not really. She just when when I brought it up and I said, "Oh, I'm doing Teen Wolf this week," and she went, "Oh, that's a classic." And I said, "Is it?" And she went, "Well, <laughs> no, it's not a good movie. It's a cult classic." I said, "Okay, there you go." I said, yes. "People who love this movie love this movie." Like you were saying, and, and with your caveat all along, it's not a great movie, but it's got one of the. It's it's very endearing. I can see how, especially someone who who grew up with it, who saw it yes. when it was of its time has stuck with it and loved it. Like there are movies from the nineties that have not aged well that I absolutely love the, to this day. Um, Ace Ventura for one, <laughs> but, but it's like coming to it from my mind, having not seen it with my sensibilities today, looking at it through the, through the goggles of today's culture, it, it has not aged well. I, I, I could totally see, all. I could totally see that. And I'll say, you know, it's funny you bring that up because through the years, like, I had just aged out past the age of Mighty Ducks, for instance, which you, you you don't even get to the Ducks part, and people will start fawning over that, like the film, but when it was in their wheelhouse, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. people of a certain age, it mattered so much to them. I never saw the appeal. Now, granted, again, higher level of production, that they didn't do it in 21 days, clearly, and all that, but there's something that resonates. There's certain sports films that are funny to me how they... 
if they captured something mm-hmm. at the time that and so and it, and it wasn't again you I think you said it the sensibility it wasn't necessarily they kept, this was what the 80s were like per se it was more like people growing up during that time and that's what I find so fascinating about what you're doing with this podcast the people growing up during that time their mindset what they were going through how this was relatable all those things yes some of the language doesn't hold up yes characters don't hold up that kind of thing but there was something about it that tapped into something that meant something to us that we even to this day can't necessarily get I can't watch that movie and get back to where I was I it, it brings me back to an emotional state of like watching it on TV and saying like you know at the time and like oh this is awesome that kind of thing. you know I thought it was yeah. the greatest but I, you know the sandlot was was similar in that, Love in that vein the right lot. like people talk about yeah. the way that you talk about that and again the production quality is higher I watched it where I wasn't the age where it related to me so much, but when I watched it, and I remember seeing it in high school, I think. Yeah, because I was um, 12 when St. Lot came out, so yeah. I was right in that yeah, wheelhouse, yeah. yeah. even so, though it's a period piece. Yes, exactly, and I sort of, but I was a little bit older than I think with that, the, the audience that has that reaction, I was right. older, but I always thought, good movie, you know, but like, that's the thing, with Mighty Ducks, it didn't have this feeling to me of like, it just really resonated in that way, whereas Teen Wolf, for so many of us, just stands out as this movie that that holds a special place in our heart literally like i i have such fond recollection of of teen wolf the movie so and M- it's mighty not ducks, even satire mighty ducks by the way has a 23 percent rotten tomato score we noticed that the other night was scrolling through Amazing. one of our streaming services and they put the rotten tomato score under the the, the graphic and it said mighty ducks 23 percent. i went was it that bad of a movie? Like, yeah, maybe it was. <laughs> maybe it was. But it's funny because I, I had never thought, and we'll get back to it. Well, much like Teen Wolf, we'll close it the way we started. Perfect. I didn't know it was a sports movie. I knew there was a basketball element. But at its heart, this is really a sports movie. There are so many basketball scenes. Basketball is what moves the whole thing along. And it's not about... The, the stakes of winning the championship. It really is about Scott and the transformation he's going through, his relationship with the other characters. But basketball is that vehicle that gets us to all of those moments. It's what continues to progress the film. Um, didn't expect that. So um, will I watch it again? Probably not. <laughs> I think that's pretty clear. I, I might not seek it out. But if it's on HBO or something when I'm flipping through, yeah, we might Catch the last half of it again. See what you're talking about. See if I can pull the steroids references out. There you out. go. There you go. Um, thank you so much for coming on. This has been so much fun catching up with you and talking about this. Uh, tell us what you got going on. I know we had mentioned at the beginning we worked together at 24-7 Sports. That was a year and a half ago that I left, and you guys have taken this to a whole other level since I left. So what you got going on over there? What's what's in the future for uh, for Adam? Yeah, and I, I really appreciate it, Zach. Not just this time, but just a uh, chance to catch up with you again. And, you know, we had such a great working relationship as colleagues. And, and I do, I, d- I definitely want to make this very clear that whatever 24 7 goes on to do, and we're excited about the future, which I'll say in a moment, but whatever we go on to do, I always said that we had this small group of foundational pieces, you being one of them. So I always give you credit that the rest of the group's still there. But I, I give you credit in saying, like, you were such a huge part of what we are building and what we're going to continue to build, um, you really setting the foundation. I will always say that. Thank so you. So thank you. I very much appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, it, it means a lot. Um, and I, I hated to lose you, but I'm, I'm, I'm proud of you and excited what you're doing now. Um, basically, we're trying to own college football and college basketball, and that's that's what we talk about. So we have some huge plans about what we're doing in the video space, but you mentioned it, uh, roster management, um, transfer portal, recruiting, you know, college sports have become, college football has become NFL light. Recruiting is the NFL draft. It happened during the eight months I was there. It, 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 <laughs> it did. really it did. did. Yeah. It did. And, and transfer portal... Now is is free agency, and it's the same with college basketball. It's the same with college football, and and the thing is, we are capitalizing on that. We have a lot of great recruiting writers, analysts, what have you, transfer portal experts, uh, national writers, and then we have this whole infrastructure, this great team site network with with the group at twenty four seven. But teaming up with with this you know powerhouse that's always been this great legacy brand of cbs sports and nfl on cbs and sec on cbs which will now be big 10 on cbs um is is pretty cool just like you talk about with with everything with country music and the history and 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 
coming into modern times mm-hmm. with, you know, the same thing sort of holds true where it's like this startup mentality. We're all hungry, just like when you were working in the building for months on end, we didn't have electricity. <laughs> and meanwhile, a Paramount company, a CBS Sports company, it's pretty remarkable. So it's this startup mentality with this this legacy brand is pretty cool to to have those together. But I'm just excited because we really do want to own the the college football, college basketball space. And I think we're on our way. And I'll just say this one thing. This year, when we haven't even fully invested to the way we're about to and really dive in, but just for the people we have, the people that have been there in the past, like yourself, we on YouTube, by every metric, surpassed the ESPN and Foxes of the world, uh, every metric for college football. And I, like that, I'm just incredibly proud of that. And the people that, like yourself, who put in all this work and everything, when there's no power, there's no lights, <laughs> you think nobody's watching, and it's like, let's create this video. All right, we're going to streamline our process, do what do we have to do. Anyway, I say all that just to say that, you know, we're on our way to do some special things. And so, you know, again, thank you for your part and all that. Thank you. And in the meantime, follow 24 7 Sports on YouTube. That's where most of the primary stuff is being outputted now. Future, I hear there are other plans to, to expand mm-hmm. that. But uh, if you have Pluto TV, and everybody has Pluto because it's free, you don't even have to sign up for the thing. Um, go watch CBS Sports HQ, and yes. occasionally you will see 24-7 sports content on there because the two uh, the two brands are so tied in together. So thank you for coming on the pocket. This has been really, really fun. I didn't expect to go an hour and 15 minutes on TV. We almost went the length of Teen Wolf just talking about it. <laughs> but I appreciate you coming in. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Zach. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Video Oblivious. And stick around. Another new episode with a different movie is just a few days away. Thanks to my guests for being a part of the show. And if you you'd like to be a part of the show, send me an email, zbennett at gmail.com. That's Z-B-E-N-N-E-T-T at gmail.com. Maybe there's a movie you love that I've never seen. Send me an email. We'll connect, and we might even talk about it here on the podcast. And don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, whatever your platform allows. Give us a good rating if you really enjoyed this podcast. And thanks again for listening to Video Oblivious. Video Oblivious.